might seem a little odd to uh, talk about harvest time this time of year because really uh, gardening season is just getting started unless you're Bob Phillips you know Bob's gardens up you know like this already but uh, he is uh, he is just a professional at that but that's what we're going to talk about because we're going to be talking about a different harvest. Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Now here's where our message comes from. Verses 37 and 38. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest Truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that He will send forth laborers into His harvest. Wednesday night, midweek service. Don't forget that. Thursday night. Six o'clock. Do everything within your power unless providentially hindered to be here. Because there's a field out there. It's plentiful. And Jesus draws this beautiful analogy. And one of the things that this master preacher could do is he could take something so common, so everyday, something people could relate to, and he could tie that to some great, Spiritual truth. Our Lord was the master at that. I had done a series several years ago on the parables of Jesus. Just phenomenal. The things he could teach by using something that was so common. And I believe it's one of the many reasons that he was so effective. Because people could relate. It was as though they were saying, yeah, I see that. Be here Wednesday night. We have some of our best services on Wednesday night. But be here Thursday night. Six o'clock. Big fields out there. There's no lack of opportunity. Let's see what Jesus had to say about this. There's three simple things that we're going to look at. Just three. And they'll all come from this text. The first thing that really stood out to me, and I want to put the focus here first because the focus is upon Christ particularly his compassion the compassion of the Savior verse 36 is interesting 
it says that Jesus saw the multitudes. Now it would be real, real easy to read that, that little part of verse 36 and just pass right over it. Jesus saw the multitudes. Or we could get real quirky and say, well, I guess he could. He evidently didn't have any vision problems. He could sit in hall. No, he missed the whole point. When Jesus looked out, what was it he saw? That's the important thing. And that's why I wanted to put so much emphasis on outreach. Because when we look out, what do we see? Subdivisions? Trailer parks? What do we see? Is that all we see? When Jesus saw this multitude, He didn't see just people. It wasn't just a mass. It wasn't a throng. No. You know what Jesus saw? He saw through divine ability souls. He saw the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. We live in such an impersonal world. In many senses, you're nothing more than a social security number. It's been that way a long time. You're a bank ID number. Such an impersonal world. Just numbers. Numbers. And I think it's one of the dreads of our days because we, we lose the sight that we're not just looking at a number, we're looking at a person. And Jesus could do that. If it were possible to take all the technology that we have and move it back to Christ's day, I don't think that it would change one bit how He saw people. And you got to remember, with everything we know that the government knows about us and all that other stuff, man, that isn't nothing compared to what God knows about us because He created us and He knows everything about us. Everything. It wasn't because of some government list or anything else, a series of numbers. No, that was the divine ability of God. And He saw souls. And it was obvious to Him when He saw them, He saw need. They were needy people. I couldn't help but think when I was reading this. When we look at people, what we see in them sometimes determines how we really feel about them. If we base everything we do on exterior appearance or how we perceive them, that can be so dangerous. I had a family member who all down through his years, when he would go out with a lady friend, it always had to be someone who was just striking. Just drop dead gorgeous. 
And if they weren't, he wouldn't even consider them. Wouldn't even consider them. He went through two failed marriages. Because his main focus was on the exterior. Now in his behalf I will say he probably obviously made some mistakes. His wife at that time made some mistakes. Here's the point. If we just look at the exterior I think we make a bad mistake. Because the things that are inside of a person sometimes can be much more beautiful than just the outside. Now factor in this fact as well. As Christians, it's real easy for us to judge someone or base our opinion on someone just on what we see on the outside and not realize that that person has a soul. I was listening to David Jeremiah the other day and he made a statement. I thought, wow. He said, every person that we see, we should view as a potential convert. I thought, that is so good. You say, Ronnie, maybe they're already saved. Maybe they are. Praise God. We won't know until we inquire. I went to Union last week in the revival. Bob and Cindy were there that night. The evangelist said something. They had been out and they'd... Wesley had him out in the community a little bit, and they had encountered a, a young girl. Remember that, Bob? So he said, I just asked her. I said, honey, are you saved? He said, that's just the way I am. He said, I just ask people. And in our day in which we live, we're so afraid to do something like that because we're afraid we'll be offensive to someone. Listen, people did that for years. I remember as a young boy growing up, people would ask you, young man, are you saved? Now at that time, it just scared me to death. But I look back now and thank God in heaven that they cared enough to ask a young boy if he was saved. How we view people particularly on the inside, says a lot about how we feel, especially in regard to people's salvation. Jesus looked out and He saw the multitude and He had compassion on them. I think sometimes many of us have forgotten the fact that there was a time that we were just like them. We were in the same boat. Lost. Lost. Someone was good enough to share Jesus with us. And many of us are saved this evening because someone, and it's Great because it's Mother's Day. A lot of times that would have been some precious godly mother. But someone cared enough about us to tell us about Jesus. He saw them. The compassion of the Savior. 
The second thing that I wrote down was the condition of the sinner. When Jesus saw them, He saw them as sheep. Sheep. That's why I said a moment ago, His illustrations were so pertinent. I mean, there's a good chance that in this setting, they could have been out somewhere and there could have been sheep out grazing somewhere. Or a shepherd out tending his flock. It's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to consider that possibility. And when he saw the multitude, to him, they looked like a huge flock of sheep, herd of sheep, whatever the proper term is, I don't know. And let me tell you something, that isn't a compliment. It really isn't. That's not a compliment. Why did he do that? They had no protection. And Jesus knew that. When he saw these people, they had no protection. Sheep. Sheep, even based on their size and their bulk, they're one of the most easy animals they are to prey upon. Almost any animal can destroy a sheep in a fight. Almost any. They have no sense of protection and and fighting back. I was watching the other day and it was kind of, it wasn't funny for the people, but I was watching somewhere and it was in, it was in the Middle East somewhere and, and it was right out in a public street and there was a goat just running around everywhere and, and he was an angry, ill goat. And he was terrorizing everybody in that little community terrorizing them, running at them. You never see a sheep do that. They don't do that. And if anything comes at them, I guess they just roll over and wait for the inevitable. That's why they need a shepherd. David the psalmist so beautifully pictures this in Psalm 23 when he talks about everything the shepherd does for the sheep he leads them he feeds them he protects them because they can't do any of that on their own even if they find a place to eat they'll eat anything within reach and a lot of times it would be things they shouldn't eat And he would scour that area and make sure there was nothing that would harm them. That's how Jesus saw this multitude of people. And that's why they, the sheep, as well as us, need a shepherd. It's because of our protection. To make this more contemporary, Satan and his minions are out to destroy and devour and to do anything they can to the church of God. Anything. They want to wreck your life as a child of God. They want to make it as miserable as possible. They cannot get your soul. They know that. So they will do everything within their power to try to make your Christian life a horrible thing. That's why we need protection. And when Jesus looked out over this mass, this multitude of people... One of the reasons he saw them as sheep 
was because they didn't have any protection. The second thing they didn't have was any direction. Jesus said they were scattered abroad. Did you get that? It's the old adage of the blind leading the blind. Again, David's analogy of Psalm 23 talks about the shepherd leading them. He leads them. You turn a flock or a herd of sheep out and they just wander around. And as one wanders off, the, the others just wander off with him. And in that day there were so many cliffs. There were so many obstacles that were potential danger. And they would walk right off of them because they had no sense of direction, none whatsoever. Compared to my wife, I am very much a sheep. I have no sense of direction. When we're out somewhere, she tells me where to go. She's been doing that for years. She tells me where to go. When we leave that place, when we get there, she has to tell me how to get back out of there. She'll say something real cute like, well, just opposite of the way you come in. I have no idea how I came in. Just tell me, woman. Do I turn left? Do I turn right? Sheep are like that. They have no sense of direction whatsoever. That's why they need someone to lead them. And I couldn't help but think, and I, I don't want to pick on them because we're blessed with some incredible young people. Out of all those that came and worked yesterday, a large percentage of them were so many of our young people. I was so proud of them. Just great. They were right there just doing whatever needed to be done. But you know as well as I know that this is one of the real dangers that young people face. They follow so much. They just follow. That's the reason I thank God for young people who break that. Young high school kids like Brody who just says, no, that's not for me. You know, if all the kids are running out and smoking the joint, no, that's not for me. No. But I remember those years and I know how easy it is to just want to follow, especially if it's the cool people. My wife was sharing a conversation with me today. It broke my heart concerning a young girl that both of us know. Not anyone related to anyone in the church or anything, but it was a young woman, young girl I know. And uh, what she told me just floored me. It shouldn't. But it floored me. Our young people face so much today. So much more than we ever thought about facing. So much more. And just as Satan has turned it up to try to destroy every Christian's life he can, he is working overtime on young people. I thank God in heaven for those young kids who says, No, no, that's not what I've been taught. That's not what I've read in my Bible. That's not what my Sunday school teacher said. No, 
No. Bobby, I say in all honesty, certainly not bragging, I say it in condemnation to myself. I wish I would have been a whole lot more like that when I was in school. I really do. I really do. They were defenseless. They had no protection whatsoever. And they were directionless as well. They didn't know where to go. And that's just such a picture of humanity today. Well, we've seen the compassion of the Savior. Jesus saw them and He had compassion on them. He's a good God, isn't He? He loves. We saw the condition of sinners compared to sheep. Now is where we really bring it home because we're going to look at the commission of the saints. Now it comes to us. That's why I emphasized Thursday night. In verses 37 and 38, Jesus changes the whole illustration. He moves from the flock to the field. Let's look at them. The flock pictures the fact that we need God. We've already talked about that. We have no protection. We have no direction. That's the field. That's the flock. They're all around us. They're everywhere. And we're not talking about just this loop or H. Eaton or back towards Siam. No, it gets much bigger than that. It's everywhere. They're everywhere. There is potential. So much. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Young people, those who do have their head on straight, who are saying, no, I'm not going to be a part of that crowd. No. You have a field in front of you that is so plenteous. Young people, there are so many classmates that you've got they're just wandering around. You see them daily. They're just wandering around. They don't know where to go. That's an opportunity for you. Remember what I said this morning? Every person that we see, we ought to see as a potential convert. Every single one of them. And there are plenty of them. It's not just the young people. The job that you go to, God has you there for a purpose. We get tired sometimes of the job that we do. And we want to think, why in the world am I stuck here? You ever thought maybe that God has you there for the express reason of being a light in a dark place. If we can somehow get that, that mentality, I think it will change our whole perspective of why we are where we are. The flock. That's a world that's in need of God. Let's talk now about the field. The flock pictures the fact that we need God. The field pictures the fact that God needs us. Oh! Seems blasphemous, doesn't it? God needs us. Is that a strange statement in light of the fact that we talk about the sovereignty of God and He's omnipotent, He can do anything He wants to? Let me rephrase it just a little bit. 
God chooses to use us. You've said the same thing. God needs us. But it sounds entirely different when we put it in that perspective. God chooses to use us. Reminding ourselves of what we just said or what I had just spoke about God is omnipotent. He's sovereign. He can do anything He wants to. God could have chosen another way. But He didn't. He didn't. God gave us the opportunity to be able to go out The night I was there, Bob, during the event, uh, uh, the revival. Do you remember when the preacher talked about, they'd been talking about one bringing one? Remember that? That just stuck so much with me. I'm going to preach on that. One bringing one. You want to grow a church? You want to see a congregation increase? Throw that challenge out there. Just one, bring one. Or I think I would go more in the direction, one winning one. That'll work. That will work. And Jesus has chosen to make us a part of the evangelistic arm that goes out there. And I think part of the reason for that is who better to tell someone what Jesus has done for them than someone that He has done those things for. I've heard people talk about going on soul winning and going on Thursday night visitation and say, I just I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Let me tell you this, you don't have to carry you a Bible around if you want to, that's good. But you don't have to carry a Bible around. You don't have to memorize a bunch of scriptures. In all probability, they already have heard them. But if you just tell them what Jesus has done for you, that can have a profound effect. That actually is one of the greatest tools of witnessing that there is. Just tell folks what Jesus has done for you. If you are a child of God, He has done some wonderful, incredible things in your life. And you oughtn't to have any trouble whatsoever in telling folks what Jesus has done for you. Jesus looked out and He saw a flock And it was a pitiful sight. They were directionless. They didn't have any protection. But then he saw a field. Potential. And it was plenteous. Plenteous. I'll close with this. The problem tonight is not a lack of prospects. They're out there. The problem sometimes is a lack of laborers. And that's where it comes to us. We talked about the compassion of the Savior. We talked about the condition of the sinner. But we close with the commission of the saints. That brings it home to us. That's what we're to be doing. That is job one for us. It really is. One winning one. Let's stand.